Okay, stop me if you've heard this one before, yeah? So there's this really funky-looking sea creature. It's called the Portuguese Man of War. It's like, not one... It's like a bunch of creatures, and they're like they're like stuck together and like working as a as like a collective, I guess, like a colony. Look, uh, we have to talk about this because this has been driving me up the wall for a very long time. Uh, the Portuguese Man of War features quite heavily in uh, popular science articles, that sort of thing. If you've uh, if you look up facts about cool animals, if you go on YouTube and look at uh, science or nature videos. Virtually every time I see people talk about the Portuguese Man of War, I hear them explain just enough to make it confusing and cool, but confusing, and then they stop there and they don't give you the full picture. Uh, and it's created some misconceptions and a lot of frustration and a lot of like recurrent questions that I see coming up about what exactly these animals are and how they work. And there's actually a really interesting conversation in here about what constitutes an individual and how we define stuff. So uh, let's break it down, okay? But we're gonna have to go through some technical stuff eventually. We'll start simple. So chapter one, what is a Portuguese man of war? Uh, Portuguese man of war is an animal. Uh, its scientific name is Physalia physalis. It's also known as the blue bottle. Um, it belongs to a group of animals called cnidarians. Now, cnidarians most famously include jellyfish, but also sea anemones and corals. So these are all part of the same evolutionary family tree, okay? It's called the Portuguese Man of War because it looks sort of like a ship and it actually sails on the surface of the sea. It has sort of a sail that catches the wind. Uh, a Portuguese Man of War is a kind of old sailing ship. Um, you can find them in Portuguese waters, but you can also find them just anywhere around the world that there's warm enough water. So, chapter two, what isn't a Portuguese Man of War? I think this is actually an easier place to start. So. Uh, first one is a Portuguese man of war is not a jellyfish. This is not a huge deal, but it's it's related to jellyfish. They're both cnidarians. It's not a jellyfish. Um, different kind of cnidarian. Uh, second misconception, uh, this is more important. A Portuguese man of war is not multiple species in the same colony. It's not the equivalent of like a cat and a dog and a goat stacked on top of each other wrapped in a trench coat. Um, that's not what we're dealing with. And the other big misconception is a Portuguese man of war is not a bunch of creatures that like found each other in the sea and started working together as a collective. Um, so now that those are out of the way, let's go over how it actually works. Chapter three, how it actually works. So imagine a sperm and an egg cell. They meet each other somewhere in the ocean and we've got a fertilized egg and that will start developing into a Portuguese man-of-war larva. And so as the larva grows, it's going to start sort of budding off new little units. We call these zooids. And these zooids are going to start developing um, different identities. Some of them are going to start becoming tentacle-bearing zooids, and they specialize in catching prey. Some of them are going to start developing the ability to eat the prey. Um, so those are the digestive zooids. Some of them are going to develop into the reproductive zooids that will produce sperm or egg. So they, they, it depends on if it's a male or female Portuguese man of war, because they are separate sexed. And there's the fourth category, which is, there's just one of these, the, the big floaty thing. Oh yeah, actually I have one of those, hang on. So this right here is the flotation sack of a Portuguese man of war. I found it washed up on a beach a bunch of years ago. Uh, it's kind of shriveled and dried up and uh, they get way bigger than this when they're alive. Um, you shouldn't touch a Portuguese man of war, but this one doesn't sting because it's dead and it doesn't have any of its tentacles. So yep, this is what they look like. It's, it's covered in sand. So one thing that you'll note about this is that because all of the zooids in a Portuguese man of war developed from the same initial fertilized egg. That means that they are all actually genetically identical to each other. And this is, you know, if this sounds strange to you because they look so different, some of them have tentacles and some of them have digestive capabilities and some of them are reproductive, then you can remember that this also applies to all the organs in your body. Like my hand and my heart and my brain are all also genetically identical to each other. They just develop differently because the genome my genome is expressed differently in different tissues and different parts of the body, depending on sort of how the genome is regulated. So if you've been following along this far, then this is the point when you might be wondering, well then what is the difference 
between a Portuguese man of war and just any other animal. Like, why do we call them a colony if the zooids in the colony are all genetically identical to each other, they all develop from the same egg, and they remain attached to each other, and they share the same nutrients, you know. They're all part of the same integrated body, basically. So why do we call them a colony? Well, this is when it gets a little bit technical. So we're gonna have to go over a couple things. And the first thing that we're gonna have to go over is the concept of homology, okay? So homology is a sort of fundamental way of thinking about different parts of living organisms. Uh, and it's when two organs or two body parts share an evolutionary ancestry. So the canonical example of this is the mammalian forelimb. So like my hand or the wing of a bat or the foreleg of a horse or the flipper of a dolphin are all homologous to each other. So if you trace their ancestry back through the history of mammals, you'll have an unbroken line of forelimbs sort of gradually evolving and shifting their appearance depending on what, they're, what kind of environment they're being adapted to. Um, so those are homologous structures. So keep that in mind and we'll come back to it later. The other slightly technical thing we'll have to get into is how cnidarians work. So cnidarians, again, that's the group of animals that we're talking about, jellyfish, sea anemones, corals, those guys. They have two basic body shapes. So one of them is a sort of cup shape with the mouth facing upwards. That's called a polyp. And so a sea anemone is a polyp, right? Uh, the other body shape is a medusa. That's like a bell shape with the mouth facing downwards. Jellyfish is a medusa. Uh, some of them actually change back and forth between polyp and medusa during different parts of their life cycle, including most jellyfish, but we, we don't have to get into that right now. The other thing is that a lot of cnidarians will reproduce asexually by sort of budding off a new, a new polyp or a new medusa attached to the previous one. So like some sea anemones will grow a new sea anemone sticking out from the original one, and then that one will break off and fall off, and now that's a new individual, right? They're genetically identical, but at least now they're separate, and they can live separate lives, okay? But a lot of cnidarians reproduce in such a way that the new budded-off polyp will stay attached to the previous one. So when you're looking at the polyps in a coral reef, they're all fairly independent of each other, but they are also still linked together by a thin strand of tissue. They do share body fluids, not like in a kinky way, like they they're, they share the same blood, basically. Um, and they are genetically identical to each other. They formed by budding off from the sort of previous polyp in the line. And so you can choose to see them as one big individual if you want to. But the thing about it is that each polyp is homologous to a single polyp in, for example, a sea anemone, right? So there are animals in the same group that whose entire body shape is homologous to just one part of the whole, in a coral reef. And so now that we understand corals just a little bit better, let's return to the group of cnidarians that the Portuguese man war belongs to, and they're called siphonophores. I'm sorry about the word avalanche, but they're really cool. You should look up siphonophores. The Portuguese man war is actually just one of like this huge group. There's like 200 species something, but they all have this thing in common where they've taken the coral mode of life uh, to a new level where each siphonophore is composed not just of polyps, not just of medusae, but like a bunch of zoids that some of them are medusae derived, some of them are polyp derived, and they perform different functions. You know, some of them catch prey, some of them do the eating, some of them do the reproducing, some of them swim, they actually propel the siphonophore colony forward. Each of these zoids is homologous to what constitutes an entire body in single polyp or single medusa cnidarians. So in other words, my hand is homologous to just the flipper of a dolphin, but the sexy parts of a Portuguese man of war are homologous to a whole jellyfish. And that's why we call them a colonial organism. That's why we consider each zooid in the whole sort of its own body. Chapter four. Where does this leave us? Well, it leaves us with two sort of competing but complementary perspectives. Now, if we take an ecological perspective, where an individual is something that is genetically the same, physiologically connected, so linked together in one body, and reproduces as a unit, then clearly the Portuguese man-o-war and any other siphonophore, for that matter, 
is one individual. It's not a colony. It's one individual. It's one sort of, it's one animal, basically. But if we take the other perspective where we consider homology and we look at sort of what constitutes a single body in related organisms, then the Portuguese man of war constitutes a colony. So both of these perspectives are equally valid, of course. We just need to think about what are the consequences of which perspective we choose to use or apply in a given situation. So if we choose to think of a Portuguese man of war from an ecological point of view, then not only is a Portuguese man of war one individual, so is this. So what you're looking at here is a whole bunch of trees. Uh, these are all genetically identical because they reproduce by cloning themselves. They shoot off new roots and those grow into new trunks. And so each trunk is connected to the same root system. It's one big thing. Its name is Pando, by the way. If we count it as one individual, it's probably the largest organism in the world by weight, as well as one of the oldest. But conversely, if we instead choose to apply the definition that people usually use when they talk about the Portuguese man of war, whether you think of it as a, a colony of zooids, uh, that means that Pando is not a single individual. Uh, it's actually a colony of trees, and each tree is homologous to the trunk of a single um, non-clonal tree, you know, like the kind that you'd usually have in your garden. And if you want to get really philosophical about it, I mean, we can take this perspective one step further, because every cell in your body is homologous to the cells of single-celled organisms, like amoeba or bacteria, and so you are a colony in sort of the same way that the Portuguese man of war is. Chapter 5. Wait, what do I tell my friends? I want to tell them a cool science fact about what a Portuguese man of war is. Please give me a new, better analogy to explain it to them instead of the three animals stacked in a trench coat. So if you compare a Portuguese man of war to a cat, let's say you start with a single cat body, but then as the kitten grows and develops, it starts sort of sprouting off entire cat bodies, and they stay attached, so like conjoined twins sort of, but like hundreds of them. And so as this cat monstrosity grows, the subcats start developing unique skills, right? So only some of them have claws and they can hunt, and only some of them have mouths and they can feed, and only some of them have reproductive parts, right? And they can reproduce. And that is kind of what a Portuguese man of war is. This is just a lake. No Portuguese man of war in here.